at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he who should die be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Hear my cry, O God. From the end of the earth I cry unto Thee when my heart is overwhelmed. For Thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Bow down thine ear, O Lord, and hear us. Unite our hearts to fear thy name. So teach us to number our days, and that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. For thou art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy to all them who call upon thee. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, and show us thy salvation. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Lord, let us give our witness to thy truth, that we may be just. Let us hear and say thy truth. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. From chapter 20, the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 6. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of servitude. Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. Thou shalt not make unto thee a carved image or any likeness. 
Now, we just said a recitation. And in the recitation that we just said was the very first of the Ten Commandments. Does anyone remember what the first of the Ten Commandments is? Can you think about that for a minute? Does anybody know the very first of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. This is the first part of our recitation that we just read. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yehovah thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of servitude. He's saying that Yehovah the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. And then he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. Thou shalt not make a graven image, nor any figure of what is in the heavens above, or the earth beneath, or what is on the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, nor serve them. So the Lord was teaching Moses, who then taught the children of Israel that he was God, and that they shouldn't carve out a statue of anything that flies in the sky, or anything that walks on the ground, or anything that swims in the sea. They shouldn't carve out a statue like that and put it up and worship it or bow down to it. They should only worship Yehovah. Now, do you know what is amazing about learning about the Lord as being our God? Is that throughout the whole word and heavenly doctrine, the Lord teaches us more and more what it means for the Lord to be our God, for Yehovah to be our God. In the New Testament especially, we learn that Yehovah is the Lord, Jesus Christ. And there are stories throughout the whole Testament, New Testament that show us who the Lord is and what he does for us and that help us picture the Lord because he walked here on earth so that we could understand who he was and how to worship him. Now there's one wonderful story that helps us perhaps especially do this. In the Gospels, did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ met with little children just like you, probably just your age? Did you know that the Lord met with little children in the Word? And do you know what he did when he met those little children? He took them, yes, do you know? Blessed he blessed them, very good. He not only blessed them, but before he blessed them, do you know what the Lord did? He took the little children up in his arms and then blessed them. This is what it says in the Gospel of John. He took the little children, in the Gospel of Luke, he took the little children up in his arms and putting his hands on them, he blessed them. Can you imagine what would that be like for the Lord to pick you up in his arms and bless you? You know what that would be like? They would like go around and just twist it around. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if the Lord picked you up and blessed you? Now, doesn't that help you see how we can worship the Lord Jesus Christ as God? Doesn't that help you picture that? Here's a picture that might help you picture it too. Maybe this is what it looked like when the Lord was with little children on earth picking them up in his arms and blessing them. Do you see all the little children around him? The Lord loves especially little children, every single little child on earth and in heaven, and wants to make all of them happy and bless them. And when you picture the Lord this way, how much the Lord teaches you in his word, 
and how much he loves you, it really doesn't make sense to worship anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, does it? It doesn't make any sense. But you know what? Maybe you do know this. The children of Israel sometimes worshipped other gods, didn't they? Does anyone know a story of when the children of Israel worshipped another god? Can you think of a graven image that they made in the word? Do you know one? The golden calf. The golden calf. In Exodus 32, while Moses was up getting this very law from the Lord on Mount Sinai, we learn that the Israelites, the children of Israel, convinced Aaron to make them a golden calf. And here is this part of the story. And the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and the people assembled to Aaron and said to him, Arise, make us gods which shall For as this Moses, the man who made us come up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what has become of him, because he was up on Mount Sinai getting the law from the Lord. And Aaron said to them, Pull off the gold earrings which are on the ears of your women, of your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people pulled off their gold earrings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took them from their hand, and he formed with it using a stylus or an engraving tool, and made it into a molten or golden calf. And they said, listen to what they said about this golden calf. These are thy gods, O Israel, which made thee come out of the land of Egypt. Did a golden calf bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Yes. Do you know who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt? The golden calf. The Lord did. And they got so confused that they thought that a golden calf could help them. And it'll help us understand this when we look at a picture of it. Do you see this picture? Do you see that golden calf? Yes. And do you see how there's Aaron worshipping the golden calf? Yes. And the people worshipping the golden calf too? too? Because Aaron was convinced by the people to do it. Now compare these two things. This picture with the picture of the Lord our God, Jesus Christ. Can this calf speak to anybody? No. And teach them the right thing to do? No. Can this calf, this golden image, this golden statue, take up children in their arms and bless them? No. It doesn't make any sense to worship a statue covered in gold, does it? Does that make any sense at all to worship this instead of the Lord? Did you know that there isn't even another story many generations later in the children of Israel when kings were established in the land? In the first book of Kings, there was a king named Jeroboam. And he did almost the exact same thing. It says in chapter 12 of the first book of Kings that King Jeroboam counseled and made two calves of gold and said unto them, These are thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Did golden calves bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt? No. Who did? The Lord. The Lord brought them out of the land of Egypt because the Lord helps us. When anything good happens for us, it's because the Lord has done it for us. And here's another picture that can make it even clearer. And here we see it's King Jeroboam because do you see the crown on his head? Yes. And look at what he's doing. He's offering incense. You can see it burning up. And then he's got his people bowing down to this statue. Does that make any sense at all? Of course it doesn't. Only the Lord can teach us the truth from the word and only the Lord can bless us and take us up in his arms. A golden statue can't do that. But you know what? Sometimes we can fall into doing something that makes no sense like this. Sometimes we can look at objects in this world and we can actually make them more important than the Lord. Maybe it's a fancy car that we really want to have and we think about it all the time and think about it more than even we think about the Lord. Or maybe it is a lot of money that you want to have and you think about it so much that we think about it even more than the Lord and we think that it'll make us happy. But only the, right, only the Lord can make us happy. Or we can even think of anything in this world, clothing or food, and that can be more important than the Lord. Or even, say, your favorite toy. If it makes you not be nice to somebody else, that can be even putting that ahead of the Lord. And that doesn't make any more sense than worshiping a golden calf, does it? So when we think of this first commandment, 
we can picture the Lord Jesus Christ as he was on earth, taking little children up in his arms just like you and blessing them. That means making you happy. And only the Lord can do that. And when we think of trying to put something ahead of the Lord, we can think about how that makes no sense, just like worshiping a golden calf makes no sense. And when we may find ourselves in a situation where we realize, I might be putting something ahead of the Lord, you know what we need to do? No. Just say these simple words that the Lord gave us in his first commandment. I am Yehovah thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. Amen. May the Lord command his angels concerning thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is written in the book of Deuteronomy, a portions of chapter 17 and 19. If there be found among you within any of thy gates which Yehovah thy God gives thee, man or woman, that has done evil in the eyes of Yehovah thy God in transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other gods, and bowed down to them, and to the sun or to the moon, 
or to all the army of the heavens which I have not commanded. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it. And inquire diligently, and behold, it is true, and the thing certain that such an abomination is made in Israel. Then thou shalt bring out that man or that woman, who have made this evil thing to thy gates, even the man or the woman, and thou shalt stone them with stones, and they shall die. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he who should die be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. Thou shalt sweep away the evil from among you. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sin, at the mouth of two witnesses or the mouth of three witnesses shall the word rise up. Reading further from the word of the Lord as it is written in the Gospel of Matthew, a portion of chapter 18. And if thy brother sin against thee, Go thy way and reprove him between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And if he shall not hear, take with thee yet one or two, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every saying may be established. Reading further from the word of the Lord, as it is written in his second coming in the work Arcana Celestia, a portion of passage 4197. The command given in the representative church that all truth shall stand on the word of two or three witnesses and not of that of one is founded on the divine law that one truth does not confirm good, but a number of truths. For one truth without connection with others is not confirmatory, but a number together, because from one may be seen another. One does not produce any form and thus not any quality, but only a number of truths that are connected in a series. For as one tone does not produce any melody, still less harmony neither does one truth. These are the things on which the law in question is founded, although in the outward form it appears to be founded in the civic state. The one, however, is not contrary to the other, as is also the case with the precepts of the Decalogue. Here end our lessons. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be for good pleasure before thy face, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Be seated. The laws that the Lord gave the children of Israel kept them safe. When they followed the laws that the Lord gave them, no enemy could defeat them, no matter how outnumbered they were. Adherence to the laws delivered to Moses from the Lord on Mount Sinai led ancient Israel to victory after victory over nations that wanted to wipe them off of the face of the earth. These incredible military accomplishments of ancient Israel are preserved by providence in the sacred scripture. But so are its defeats. When they failed to follow the law, they were their own worst enemy. Their failure to follow the law invited enemy invasions and resulted in great suffering over and over again. There seemed to be as many defeats as victories, if not more. This same dynamic can be true for us, too. Following the laws that the Lord has given us leads to victory over the hells and to eternal happiness. But departing from the Lord's laws leads to invasion by hell and the resulting misery. When we experience victory over the hells, it is the Lord's victory. And just like the Israelites could not be defeated when they followed the Lord's laws, neither can we. The Lord's law is supreme, and following it guarantees spiritual victory. But strain from it invites enemy invasion. The chief law transgressed over and over again in the Old Testament and by us is the first of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. And in Deuteronomy 17, the punishment for serving other gods is death by stoning. What a seemingly brutal instruction by the Lord. But let's just stick with the literal sense of this law for a moment. And the context may help us understand even this very difficult law in the Old Testament. Every time the Israelites worshipped other gods, there were horrifying effects on the people. When they worshipped a golden calf, as Moses was receiving the law from the Lord on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people were killed as a result. When the Israelites later began worshipping Baal and intermarrying with the Midianites, 24,000 people died in a plague. And the entire book of Judges is a continuous cycle of worshiping other gods and the people being taken captive and put into slavery and oppressed by other countries as a result. Just on the level of the literal sense, worshiping other gods meant oppression and death for the people. If it did not stop, it brought more and more misery on the people. Obeying the first commandment was a matter of national security for ancient Israel. And punishment for violating this law was central to their safety. Now the Lord explains in Apocalypse Revealed that the ancient world worked much, much differently than our world does today. It says in Apocalypse Reveal that in ancient times all things of the church were represented before their eyes. If the people practiced idolatry, uh, idolatry then, they experienced its representative effects. And the representative effect of idolatry is slavery and death. Because of this, they were commanded in Deuteronomy to sweep away the evil from among them. And the evil was swept away through stoning. But there was a process that had to be followed. And this process is much more familiar than the rest of this brutal Old Testament law on stoning. The process leading to the punishment of stoning included the requirement of diligent inquiry and the testimony of more than just one witness. And then, 
Only once the worshiping of other gods was established with certainty by following these two requirements, only then was the punishment exacted. This process then resulted in protection by the Lord from the enemies of Israel. Now, it certainly takes an understanding of this, this commandment in the internal sense to see how it can help us and teach us today. The process for this punishment is there in the word to help us eliminate idol worship in ourselves and liberate us from the oppression of evil that comes along with idolatry. In getting to the point where we can see the spiritual aspects of this law, it can really help to keep in mind that the Lord abrogated the natural aspects of this law when he was on earth. Meaning he repealed it in a literal sense. He simply said in the Gospel of John, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And in one simple statement, the Lord did away with this practice reserved only for times when representatives worked much differently than they do today. When we look at the internal sense of stoning, knowing that the literal sense has been abrogated, it makes things much clearer. In the Arcana, the Lord teaches that stoning signifies to extinguish or blot out falsities. It makes sense that when, after diligent inquiry, we identify false gods that we are worshiping, things we are putting above the Lord, that we should use the truths we know to remove those falsities from our minds so we stop following them. But the witness provision in this law in Deuteronomy can really help us better understand exactly how we can do this. At least two witnesses are required before false ideas and their accompanying evil loves can be removed because as the Lord also says in the Arcana, one truth does not confirm good, but a number of truths, for one truth without connection with others is not confirmatory, but a number together, because from one may be seen another. Truths work together to eradicate evil and falsity. But one truth on its own, without any context, is not enough. And it can actually do harm. Just like one witness was not enough to convict a person of idolatry in ancient times. One witness could have led to a false accusation. And one truth on its own, without the context of other truths, can be misconstrued. One truth on its own cannot blot out falsity. It does not give a full enough picture. In order to blot out falsity in our own minds, let's look at how we can use this law regarding multiple witnesses. We can look at two different examples of how this could work. Different examples of how this, how this multiple witness law can effectively combat idolatry for us. First, we'll take a look at a general example, and then we'll look at a more specific application of this multiple witness approach. Generally speaking, if truths regarding mercy do not also accompany truths regarding judgment, we will not be able to eradicate idolatry in ourselves. If we think we are condemned to hell every single time we put our desires ahead of the Lord, every single time that we practice idolatry, we will have no hope of salvation. We won't be able to address the evils that we need to address in ourselves. Why bother identifying bad things that we are doing and thinking and judging them if it only will lead to condemnation and eternity in hell? What good are judgments about ourselves if they don't lead to improvement? Without knowing that the Lord is an all-merciful God who forgives us every single time that we ask, the truths regarding self-examination and just judgments will not help us. Conversely, using only the truths regarding the Lord's mercy without truths regarding judgment won't help us either. Knowing that the Lord loves every single one of us, no matter what we do, is no help if we don't also rely on His truth to help us worship Him rather than ourselves. Just as judgment alone won't help us change, 
Truths regarding mercy all on their own won't help us either. Judgment on its own can even become like an idol itself where self-condemnation rather than life change becomes our focus. And mercy alone can do this too, where we take a love conquers all sort of approach that leads to actual rejection of life changing truths. Judgment on its own may lead us not to change because there's no hope. And mercy alone may lead us not to change because there's no need. But put, to the, but put the two ideas together and live them. Act based on the testimony of two witnesses. And whatever idol we are putting ahead of the Lord will fall. And the saving power of the Lord will flow in. As the Lord says in the Psalms, mercy and truth have met together. Justice and peace have kissed. The two witnesses of mercy and judgment are powerful truths that will work together to blot out the falsity that we have embraced. Now we can look at a more specific example of this law regarding multiple witnesses in respect to marriage and conjugal love. The belief all on its own in this beautiful truth that the states of conjugal love are innocence, peace, tranquility, inmost friendship, full confidence, and a mutual desire of mind and heart to do each other every good. A belief in this truth alone may be no help when a marriage is a source of pain rather than happiness. This beautiful description of the states of marriage and conjugal love can actually become useless against threats to a marriage that evil spirits pose if this beautiful truth is separated from other teachings that the Lord gives us that help us to achieve these wonderful states. Getting through hard times in a marriage where this beautiful truth seems like fiction requires a reliance on other teachings about conjugal love as well, more than just one witness. Withstanding the powerful but idolatrous idea of divorce being justified when there is no adultery requires more than just the truth about how wonderful marriage can be. Teachings like the ones the Lord gives us about the need for appearances of love and friendship between married partners are more witnesses of truth that can blot out falsities threatening our marriages. We find in the heavenly doctrine that the Lord knows full well that marriages will run into times when we need to act like a good friend and a good spouse even when we are not feeling it. We find in conjugal love that the Lord teaches that these efforts are necessities and utilities and that without them houses and therefore societies could not hold together. The Lord teaches us that being a good husband or wife, when we are not feeling it, is for the sake of amendment and reconciliation, for the sake of peace and order, and for the sake of the marriage covenant that is binding to the end of life. These truths, together with the beautiful teachings regarding the wonderful states of marriage, can give us confidence to withstand the idolatrous notions that threaten our very marriage vows. When we look at these examples, mercy and judgment together, the joys of marriage together with the ways that we can work through the challenges, perhaps we can see how important this multiple witness approach is. Perhaps we can see how much strength there is in the Lord's divine truth when it is seen as a series of truths connected together rather than the single truth here and there. Finally, when we think about the power of multiple witnesses, we may find it surprising that this divine law has found its way, no doubt, through the secret guiding hand of providence into the supreme law of the land in the United States of America. The Constitution states that no person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act. Treason means betraying one's country making war against it, giving aid and comfort 
to its enemies. Worshipping other gods in ancient times actually had similar effects as treason does today. When the Israelites worshipped other gods, their nation was attacked. For us today, treason can lead to our nation being hurt by enemies as well. But to expose treason, to expose idolatry, to expose temptations, to put ourselves ahead of the Lord, and to rid ourselves of these effects, of these threats, two witnesses at least are needed. This law regarding stoning protected the Israelites when they followed it literally, and it can protect us now when we follow it spiritually. Just as more than one witness was necessary before this punishment in the Old Testament law could occur, truths will blot out falsities when we understand them in their proper context connected to other truths. They will keep us safe from the devastating effects of idolatry because we will know how to properly use them. We will have the confidence to make decisions about how we can be open to the Lord removing idolatry in us based on the overlapping testimony of multiple witnesses of truth. We will have a truer and more living faith then. As we read in True Christian Religion, true faith, by an abundance of truths cohering, becomes more capable of conjunction with the goods of charity consequently more capable of alienation from evils, and gradually more removed from the allurements of the eye and the lusts of the flesh, therefore in itself happier. Especially does it become more powerful against evils and falsities, and thus more and more living and saving. Amen. And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. shall bear witness to thee, and marvel at the words of grace which proceed out of thy mouth. Yes, I come quickly. Amen. Yes, Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
Thank you.